In a nation of more than a billion people, how do you find just one young child? Against all odds, we're on a search for a baby boy left behind in India. It's a quest to find a twin boy born via surrogacy but not wanted by his Australian parents. We know the parents' name, we know the birth dates. We search through the bureaucracy and back streets of the sprawling capital, New Delhi. Was the child sold? Was the child left on the street? We're just um, looking for a baby uh, boy. Um, obviously, Sorry. we've been pushed away. Could you please first tell me where the boy is? What has happened to that child? Jesus, please leave us alone. This is not the story of just one surrogacy deal gone wrong. It's the story of an industry that's wide open for abuse. In 2012, an Australian couple decided to leave their baby boy behind in India. A twin, he was born via a surrogate mother in New Delhi using the sperm of the Australian father. It's unclear whether a donor egg was used. The Australian parents chose to return home to Sydney with just his sister, and the Australian government agreed to let them do it. It's in breach of all sorts of human rights conventions and criminal, it's, it's, it's a criminal offence in many places, so I think it's an appalling thing. The case highlights the perils of a surrogacy industry that's drawn hundreds of Australian couples each year to India in search of babies. Now India's refusing to issue visas to Australians for surrogacy deals. The boy's case may never have emerged publicly if not for the passion of two leading Australian judges. Any judge in family law, if he or she were asked to consider um, someone's suitability, um, for a parental role, would be deeply concerned that a couple would commission a child and then decide uh, to separate twins. Those children are related, they have the right to know each other. I think the whole issue of surrogacy is greatly concerning, particularly when there are circumstances in which people can choose the sex of the child and so forth. We're commoditising children and that's a huge concern. Baby! <laughs> in India, the surrogacy industry is worth more than $500 million a year. Critics say that it's been used for child trafficking. It's also been dogged by claims of exploitation of surrogates and a serious lack of regulation and transparency. Sources have told foreign correspondent this case of the boy left behind has been mishandled by successive Australian governments. His rights have been brutally violated right from the beginning. He doesn't know his identity. The case has attracted international attention from organisations concerned with child trafficking. Anjali Pawar and Arun Dole are on a mission. They're here to help foreign correspondent piece together what happened to the boy. For Arun, this is a very personal quest. I grew up in a white family and I don't belong there. It's a very deep question of belonging and that creates not necessarily confusion, it creates a friction within yourself and um, all adoptees, I mean, sooner or later start searching for the roots. 
Arun spent nearly a decade searching for his birth mother in India. On that journey, he met Anjali, who helped him find her. Through their connection, they now help others find their families. I never understood the people from Australia, how they can abandon and the excuse what they gave is they can't afford it, it was bullshit. If you read the Supreme Court judgments even, or High yeah. Court judgments... Yeah. Before we head out on our search, we pore over heavily redacted Australian Freedom of Information documents obtained by foreign correspondent. As luck would have it, they contain the birth date of the twins, the 27th of November, 2012. This increases our chances of finding the official adoption papers for the boy. If we have the birth date, then we can start searching in the uh, registries, birth registries. And from there we could hopefully trace the adoptive family, so-called adoptive family. With the twins' birth date in hand, Anjali and Arun begin the search. As the summer pushes up towards 48 degrees, they weave their way through the labyrinth of India's bureaucracy, attempting to find the twins' birth certificates. In India, it seems there's always something to celebrate. For Anjali and Arun, it's the discovery of the birth certificates that brings us one step closer to finding the missing boy. Uh, we know the name of both the children, the boy and girl. We know the parents' name, we know the birth dates, exactly where this child is born. And as well as we got the permanent address of this, uh, uh, these parents who are living in Australia as well as where they stayed in India. But importantly, we now know that the name of the boy when he was born was Dev. I don't know where the boy is. We can speculate from whether he was born disabled to whether he's being placed in a very rich, rich well-to-do uh, family where he gets every... Uh, uh, amenity. Uh, so we don't know. What we do know is that nine days after the birth of the twins, the Australian parents made a series of anxious phone calls to the Australian High Commission. They revealed their plans to leave Dev in India, saying they couldn't afford to support both him and his sister and that they already had a boy and wanted a girl to complete their family. On December 12, the couple arrived at the High Commission for a formal meeting. They told officials they wanted to give the boy to Indian friends who were unable to conceive a child. But a memo from the High Commission in early 2013 suggests they misled consular staff, that in fact, the proposed adoptive parents were not close family friends, but were known through a mutual friend. So the family adopting the boy were not friends at all. The story rattled and upset Australian High Commission staff dealing with the case, so much so they approached the Chief Justice of Australia's Family Court, who was attending a legal conference here at this Delhi Convention Centre. Traumatised and seeking her counsel, they told her that money had changed hands between the Australians and the couple that had taken the baby boy. The Chief Justice says if that's true, it amounts to child trafficking. When I asked what had happened to the other child, they said, well, someone in the end had come forward uh, and said that they were known to the family and would take the child, but they expressed to me their great concern that in fact money had changed hands. And if that's true, then that's basically trafficking children. Diana Bryant says the High Commission officer told her she tried to convince the Australian couple to change their minds, to bring both babies back to Australia. They were required, of course, to provide the documentation, travel documentation for the one child and the other child was left there. And I found that a fairly shocking story. And of even more concern, these Freedom of Information documents reveal the couple were warned by High Commission officials that the baby boy could be left stateless. But as High Commission staff tried to delay the Australian parents' departure from India, 
word came from Canberra, approving Australian citizenship and one passport for one child only, the baby girl. There was definitely uh, some pressure being placed to, to expedite the process to ensure that they could return with the child. And you believe that came from Australia? Well, I was told it did. Hello. Hello. I'm Shaker Nafaday, a senior lawyer at New Delhi's Supreme Court, believes this could constitute a case of child abandonment. And what's your view about the fact that the Australian government or government officials knew that this Australian couple left behind one of their children born via a surrogate? If the Australian High Commission officials had information about the child being that of the Australian couple, then I'm afraid uh, what they have done is improper. I would describe it as uh, aiding and abetting the Australian couple in abandoning the other child. Aiding and abetting. For the next 24 hours, through the maze of digital registries and dusty records around New Delhi, Anjali and Arun keep searching for the registered adoption papers. It's a daunting task. But there is a glimmer of hope. Anjali and Arun have been meeting a well-connected contact and they've come away with two new clues to follow. We had a nice uh, discussion about whole issue. She understands the issue. And uh, we got the surrogate mother's details as well as the IVF uh, clinic's details. Right. This is main market gully, that's why it's a little bit bigger. And now we head to Kapasera, one of New Delhi's large low income districts where the surrogate mother lived in 2012. Her name, we've discovered, is Vimlish Devi. If we can find her, just maybe she can shed some light on the story. Surrogates often come from poor families and are paid around 6,000 Australian dollars, equivalent of about three years' wages. A local businessman agrees to help. And what is this? We have come from high wage. Uh, Arun and Anjali search door to door in the searing heat. Uh, but the surrogate can't be found, so we pursue another lead. The second clue provided by the source is the IVF clinic engaged by the Australian couple. It's Delhi IVF in Bengali market. Hi, uh, Samantha Hawley from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I was after Dr Anup Gupta, please. Dr Anup Gupta operates this IVF clinic. We believe that it was here that the twins embryos were implanted into the surrogate mother. OK, I'll leave you my card. Can you please get Anup Gupta to call me urgently? In 2013, this clinic was raided and closed amid allegations of gender selection, a practice that is illegal in India. It was later reopened. We're told Dr Gupta is out of town. We have another appointment to return for an on-camera interview with him the following day. Um, so I've just been in there with the doctor of the Australians and he had promised that he would do an interview with us and he's now uh, reneged on that. Um, he's told me 
uh, some things about the Australian couple, including that uh, they knew they were having twins from six weeks, uh, that they decided once the twins were born to leave one of the twins below. And um, obviously Sorry. we've been pushed away now again. Thank you. Please. Keep rolling. It doesn't look nice. No, it's not a nice much. case, is it? It's Thank not you. a nice case. A child's been left behind. It's not it's a nice not. case. It's your government to be done. Ma'am, sir, you want me to take an action against you? I know my rights. Put it off. It seems we've hit a dead end. No one wants to talk about the baby left behind. So we follow our last lead. When you commission a birth via a surrogate, you have to declare your address in India on the birth certificate. We track down that location. This is the apartment where the Australian couple stayed when they came to take their baby home. Oh, hello, hi. My name's Samantha Hawley. I'm from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Okay. I've just come here. We're just um, looking for a baby uh, boy that was left behind here in India by some Australians, an Australian couple or an, a couple that came from Sydney. I'm just wondering, um, do you know? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, let me have a chat on the phone and then I'll let you know. Just oh, wait for a while. Okay. Thank you very much. We learn this is where the Australian man's sister lives with her husband and three children. He explains the situation to the ABC's local producer. So he has been adopted out to uh, an acquaintance that the family knows within the relatives, like mm. outside distant relatives. Itna, and he lives it, in... It's a well-to-do, very rich family and well-to-do family. It's very a very rich family, family well-to-do family. It's in Rohini Pitampura side, which is West Delhi. And uh, all the legalities were performed according to the uh, Indian, uh, Indian, Indian law. laws. And was the boy healthy? Yes. So why did they leave the boy? Why did they leave the boy? But she could she should have not actually <laughs> it, was their, it was only their personal decision. Husband and wife only. I think no one other, other yeah. no other one consulted whether they want to keep or not. Simple reason, as I know, we can't afford three child. Because living in India and living in Australia very much difficult. Different situations. So they won't listen to you. Did try to convince them against. Did I did, but they have their own, you know, choices. Did they give the money? Not at all. We are good people. We are uh, well to do. We have everything. Yes, I understand. But did the did the commissioning did no money? not at all no money adoption no, not on, not even a single penny involved. There is concern about the boy, that was all, and we just want to check the boy. He is very, I think so, he is very well. His name is Palan Pochan, he is very good. He is very good. He is very good. If you have any concern, then I will request him to please stop it. 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 We have not been able to find the registered adoption deeds, but the Australian government says the adoption is legal. Now, with all other avenues exhausted, the only way left to find the boy Dev is to call the Australians named in the birth records. The family that couldn't afford to support baby Dev live in Sydney's northwest. The father is a corporate accountant. His wife, until recently, ran a family daycare centre from home. Indian-born, they're now Australian citizens. They have a son and a little daughter, Dev's twin sister. We've chosen not to name them. It's Samantha Hawley here, calling from the ABC. From New Delhi, we call the family home in Australia. We are very normal people, so this is, we never thought we will do something wrong. So this is not a normal thing for us. Now let me just say, uh, yeah. there is great concern for the welfare of the child. There are allegations that you broke the law in two countries, in Australia and India. I'm offering you a right of reply. I, 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 we don't want that. Right? I'm please humbly telling you again and again, Samantha, Australian government has all the information, each and all right. every. Why do you want to make it public? 
I'm sorry, the match is already... We have not done any offense. We, we have not done any offense. We have done everything legal. And we humbly request you, please do not chase us. Please leave us alone. Foreign correspondent gave the couple a second opportunity to speak on camera, but they didn't reply. <laughs> This case is disturbing on a number of fronts. It's illegal in New South Wales to have a baby via international surrogacy. But immigration authorities routinely ignore the state laws by allowing Australian couples to bring home babies born by surrogacy. If those couple, that couple, for example, were from a state like New South Wales, then uh, uh, they've clearly broken the law and uh, I would imagine there'd be a number of reasons why uh, the police should be involved and, uh, and obviously the welfare authorities as well. I would have thought also that Australia has some obligation to track down and, uh, and look after the welfare of the child that has been left behind. <laughs> Judge John Pascoe says while there are couples from Australia who are desperate for children, it doesn't mean the surrogacy industry can continue to act with impunity. It really is a bit like the Wild West and again, part of the problem is that genuine decent people uh, get tarred with the same brush uh, as people who are going into surrogacy arrangements uh, and would not be seen as proper parents for a child and trying to find... Shaker Nafaday wants the couple to be charged with child abandonment in India. It's an offence in India. It's uh, punishable up to seven years imprisonment. And uh, I don't know whether the government of India uh, proposes to institute extradition proceedings in Australia to have that couple extradited to India to meet this charge. There is a treaty between India and Australia about extradition and it, in my view, the offence clearly falls within the purview of that treaty. Um, at the end of the day, this is a matter for the individuals to make themselves aware of the laws of our country and the laws of the country in which they hope to seek some sort of surrogacy arrangement. The ABC approached Australia's Foreign Minister about the case on a trip to India. Julie Bishop says baby Dev was adopted legally. DFAT made what I believe are appropriate inquiries as to the um, outcome of the other child and we were satisfied that there was a valid adoption in place and therefore under the um, responsibility of the Indian authorities. But she does point the finger at the previous Labor government, which was in power at the time in 2012. Thank you very much. These are matters that occurred under the previous government and and questions about uh, who knew what when should be directed to the relevant Foreign Minister and Prime Minister Gillard, I believe it was, and I believe it was Foreign Minister Carr, because they were obviously the relevant ministers at the time. Um, but I'm satisfied that the Department of Foreign Affairs officials acted appropriately. Bob Carr denies knowing anything about the case. I don't recall uh, surrogacy coming up in terms of our relationship between uh, the, the bilateral relationship between Australia and India and uh, I did not contact the uh, Australian High Commission about a case. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Freedom of information documents reveal the Prime Minister's office was consulted about Baby Dev's case but the former Prime Minister Julia Gillard says she was not personally advised about it. Well, I haven't um, gone back to circumstances before I became the Foreign Minister because I don't have access to the uh, records and files um, prior to becoming Foreign Minister. They are records and files under a previous government and that's why I've suggested that uh, Prime Minister Gillard and Foreign Minister Carr would be best placed to answer questions. <laughs> In 2012, when baby Dev was born, more than 500 couples returned from India with babies born out of surrogacy. Both the Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit Court and the Chief Justice of the Family Court say the only way to fix the lack of transparency in the international surrogacy business is to have a national inquiry. 
I think an inquiry is the first step. I think there are a number of different things that we could do. Um, I've suggested that legalising commercial surrogacy in Australia is one of them, but there are other things that could be done as well. I know not everybody supports that, but an inquiry enables all the views to be put forward and discussed. I think an inquiry is desperately needed. Um, I think in that way we can protect the best interests of, uh, of people who would be very good parents. We can protect uh, the best interests of the birth mother and most importantly we can protect the best interests of the child. After 11 days on the ground in New Delhi, we learnt where the twins were born and the name of their surrogate mother. We spoke to the Australian's lawyer and their doctor and members of their family, and we rang the Australians directly. But still, we couldn't find the boy left behind. However, Anjali and Arun say they're determined to keep looking. Dev would now be a two and a half year old toddler the pair will also be lodging an official complaint with the Indian police. Even if we find the adoption deed, or they can produce the adoption deed, which they have done later, they have abandoned the child in the first place. I mean, you cannot just commission two children and, you know, leave one behind. I feel really bad about that child and angry on the authorities, and uh, means Australian authorities and parents. The, the way they treated their child as a commodity.